I'll just watch. Let me know when you go um, Facebook Live. Okay. All right, we're ready. <laughs> All right. We are going to um, watch as participants enter. So we'll give it a couple minutes. All right. Looking at my dog sleeping a few feet away from me. I love that. And a few, um, hold on, let's. Oh, Can you see her? I love that. Yes, there's <laughs> there's very few things um, that are more peaceful than watching <laughs> watching an animal sleep. That's wonderful. I know. And I know that there could be a little bird singing or something outside doing all this going to make her erupt in terror. Okay. Um, but so we might get that interruption if she. Okay. Um, That's okay. Why don't we, um, yeah. trying to think, why don't we begin? Um, oh, excellent. Um, so welcome. Um, I'm hoping that we are live on Facebook. Um, I see we certainly have some people joining us. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I see um, Dennis has already shared a glad to be here. So we're glad to have you. Um, my name is Rebecca Hellman. I am the lead clinician at the Heron Project and I am incredibly, incredibly grateful to be here today um, at this Lunch and Learn. So I wanna thank all of you who are joining us. Um, I want to um, remind everybody just some housekeeping. Um, if you have questions throughout this hour, please, um, if you are watching um, on Facebook Live, please just um, jot those questions into the chat and we will get them. Um, as well as if you are joining us um, through the link that you registered for, there's a Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen. And please feel free to jot down um, comments or questions that you have for either myself or my guest today. Um, and we will get to them um, as we go. So um, again, it is my absolute pleasure and honor. I feel incredibly grateful to be able to share this hour um, with my guest, um, who is an amazing author um, and who doesn't really know this yet, but has probably touched many more lives than he is aware of um, through his writing. So um, welcome, Mike Torville, to our Lunch Thank and you. Learn. I Thanks, Rebecca. Oh, I appreciate you being here yeah. and taking the time. And um, we, we came um, together, you, you came to me through um, this book that you, that you wrote that I want to talk about today. So uh, Voices from the Fallen. Um, the true stories of addiction, grief, recovery, and courage. And um, what part of what we do at the Heron Project is provide online support groups for um, families who have loved ones who are either actively still in addiction, in recovery, or those who have lost somebody to substance use disorder. And your book came to me through a group member who I am grateful for every day. Um, and you know, we, we read it in my family support group, and um, I certainly have used it in other groups as well. So I just want to kind of start, if you don't mind introducing yourself, oh. um, telling us a little bit about you. We'll start there. It's my turn. All right. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. I appreciate that. Um, and thanks for having me on. I really do appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, and as you said, we, we I wrote this book, Voices from the Fallen. Um, it came out in January, um, and it was a struggle through all the COVID nonsense because halfway through, I was meeting with people, interviewing them in person, and everything came to a screeching halt. So it it, it altered the, the, the timing, but that's okay. It's out now. Um, and so anyway, I, I this is the second book. I wrote a book a few years ago, and uh, that was good because it gave me the the ins and outs of how to get it published how to get it working because that was a um, a learning curve a few years ago so i'm glad that uh that's over and enabled this one to get done so <laughs> that's amazing so um tell us a little bit um where'd the idea come from um what was the inspiration 
Well, it was a, it was a, a few things. And um, one is when we, in the summer of 2019, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Kirk Jonah, whose son had passed from a heroin overdose in April of 2016. Uh, he was doing a walk. It was called Jack's Walk at the uh, in Holyoke at the reservoir. Anyway, while doing this, I was simultaneously, we were working with the movie producer to do a premiere of this other movie we were working on. And what I, I said, to, I said, you know, we ought to do a movie about heroin addiction because um, this pr particular producer has done movies about uh, high school bullying, internet safety, things like this. So, well, why not do this? And I have a friend who, whose son uh, was lost and he speaks at schools and he's, he's trying to, you know, create more awareness and so on. And so anyway, Jason, the producer said, sure, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, and I said, well, hold time out. I said, let's do it. I haven't talked to the family yet. <laughs> we need to see if they can get on board. So we, we talked through that in the in early June of 2019. In that summer, um, it was sort of really rapid fire. We did the, the scripting, the auditions, the casting and filming all. We were done by September. It was, it was really crazy. But during that time, and you asked what, how did this evolve? Um, Kirk Jonah, my friend, speaks at schools, and that he has this movie. I said, wouldn't it be great if we had a little, had a little booklet, something that's a, a takeaway, something tangible that some of these listeners could go away with, some information, resources, and so on, and maybe your son's story can be part of that. And that was the genesis of it. But as I had started to learn throughout doing this movie. That's why I think for me, this movie was so important because I got to hear from so many different people who had experienced it through their brother, their father, their mother. Their... And I thought, oh my gosh, there is, this affects so many people. You could hardly find a family that's not affected by it. And so I thought the story of, of, a, of a 19 year old certainly would help. It would be relatable, but there's so many more people um, in a different age, different race, economic status, and so on, whose stories need to be told also. And that's where we started to put this together. There is another thing, and I, it's worth mentioning here, because during that time, um, I think it was in June or July of 2019, I went to the Agon High School and I saw Chris Heron speak. And his story obviously is very impactful, very powerful. And I sat there listening to him and I thought, you know, this is, this is great information. I think the people in the audience were, uh, I say spellbound, but that's not the right, because everyone was quiet. <laughs> everyone was intensely listening. And, uh, and I thought about his story and I thought, you know, that's as impactful as it was, he had the, the uh, capacity, he had a platform, he had an ability to tell his story that can impact lives. I said to myself, what about so many other people who don't have that mm -hmm. capacity or the platform or know where to begin, you know? And that's where I started thinking about the, the everyday people, our neighbors, our friends who need their stories told. So yeah. between those two things, that's how this all started. I, I love that. I frequently um, will share that I'm incredibly grateful that Chris, um, can do what he does in an auditorium and, and, and silence and, and have um, many adolescent faces drawn to him and quiet. And I am so grateful that he can do that so that we can do what we do for all those other families. I think, you know, being able to um, show his bravery and sharing his story and then trying to inspire other um, young people to, to share theirs as well. But so I'm, I, I'm with you. I'm forever grateful. If anybody hasn't heard Chris speak, you know, certainly can't hear a pin drop. It is, it is silent. And, right. um, but you're right. All, there are, uh, hundreds, thousands of families who, um, have a story, um, or, or, you know, an experience. Um, yeah. so that's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm glad you got to hear him speak also. Um, and, and, so there's irony that then you you get to you get to us a completely different way. So, yep. <laughs> <laughs> which is wonderful. So, um, your the the 
can you just describe a little bit about how the book is set up in terms of um, maybe placement of stories or experiences, or was there a pattern to it, or just share a little bit about what's in this book if somebody hasn't read it? Yeah, I, I will share a little bit about, because there's so many puzzle pieces that came together, and I really didn't know in the beginning how this would evolve, because again, it, it was going to be a booklet, and I said, wait a second, it may have a better idea. So we thought the obvious, why, why write this book, right? What, what's it going to accomplish? And I think, again, as mentioning to you, there's so many people whose stories can make an impact on other people's lives. And what I thought is, let's say there's somebody in a group and they're sharing their stories with the people in the group. And that's the purpose to that. One, it's therapeutic for them telling their story to get it out, to be honest about it and, and feel they're not alone because other people can say, yeah, that's me or I have that and I can relate to that. Um, but the whole point is even to make people feel they're not alone, right? Um, so it's good for this person telling the story and other people to hear that. And if somebody can be inspired, if somebody can make a change, be motivated to say, you know what, um, I don't want that to happen. I need to avoid. These are signs I see in my family member and I want to correct them or um, intercept <laughs> at some point and change and intervene, you know. So it, that was the, the purpose. So some of these stories can be relatable to people and others can connect with it. So the idea, okay, was there, but then um, how can it be relatable? It had to be relatable because it had to reflect people in everyday lives and not only reflect them, but their family members and what they're going through. And, but then the other thing is, I think the, and we talked about this earlier, one of the things to be different isn't just from the person who was addicted point of view, it's inserting family members' perspectives throughout. That tells a whole different story sometimes. Um, and so this becomes something that it's a shift, right? You're, you're reading the attic, okay, and then you're, you shift to the mother, father, brother, friend who says, oh, wait a minute, that this isn't the way they were exasperated with their inability to stop everything. And they're, they were helpless. And I think that's a feeling people do relate to. So we were trying to find how it could be different. And I thought maybe those components will help. And it had to be, and each one is written first person because it's their voice, right? It's their experience that they're sharing. And I think that's also an important factor because I think if somebody's going through this, they want to hear from other people's going through the, the same war, the same battle, mm -hmm. not just someone like myself to say, okay, well, I, yeah, you wrote this, but you don't really understand. Well, from these voices, they can see these people do. Um, now you get the, the, the person who stories it, and then you get the family, but then there was another aspect I thought, and you might've remembered this because in each story and at the back of the book, there is a clinician's comments. This sort of gives a third point of view that's, uh, neutral right it's not an emotionally attached to the story this is sort of a neutral outside objective point of view and here's here's what's a common trait here's what we see often so there's that to sort of shift it a little bit and i think the more important thing that occurred to me is the other point of view is this the reader's point of view how are they seeing this? So at the end of each chapter, we have questions, kind of the what ifs. What would you do if, or would you have waited as long uh, to intervene as this person did? Or would you have taken them back? And somebody reading might've said, oh, I wouldn't have taken them back that soon <laughs> because that's a normal thing, right? Uh, so these questions are posed at the end of each chapter to give then the reader's point of view and maybe make them to think, it, think of it from a, a different, um angle mm. so uh, that's as a clinician it. i appreciate that tremendously um because what i think we find is a couple of things um our when we encourage somebody in early recovery um to to seek out like people so um na aa 
the, the groups that are the recovery groups, we want people to sit in a room with people and with like minds and, and in the same place to feel that validity of their experiences. Yes. And so why wouldn't we do the same thing for family members and for loved ones? Because if you're in your own house experiencing things that you cannot get validated somewhere else, you feel incredibly alone, but, but wonder if that's really what's happening and start to question your own reality. So the idea that, you know, you're providing these experiences for people to, to be validated by is, is fantastic. So I, I love that. And I also love the, um, the perspective of the clinician because it does, um, again, validates, but it also normalizes the experiences as, you know, clinically significant. These are what we see when we are treating either individuals or family members, you know, with substance use disorder. So, yeah. um, yeah, I appreciate that. As a clinician, I appreciate that <laughs> tremendously, but I also That's know why that, I said it, you know, <laughs> but I also know that, in a, you know, in our groups, um, when we've read this, that is, you know, it's not like, um, it is often that people will then say, oh, well, did you see the, you know, the, the questions at the end? What do you think about it? So it's, it's a, it's a discussion point for those reading it, but also if, if you're lucky enough to be able to share the experience of reading your book with other people, it's incredibly helpful. So um, you used, um, I can't even imagine how many families or people did you interview to, to get, what do we have, nine? Uh, there were, there was going to be nine originally, but there were eight. Eight. It turned out to be eight. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's a, a few. <laughs> I thought in the beginning, oh, how in the world am I ever going to find eight or nine people? Well, let me tell you, <laughs> that's where I was, you know, that old saying about drinking from a fire hose. I was overwhelmed with, with people and um, going through this. And I think what I was looking for through that, and you could tell by reading it, it's, it, it had to be a diverse group of people. And because again, back to the relatable aspect, right? I read um, The Heroin Diaries by Nikki Six, and that book was, uh, was, was eye-opening, but, um, and I'm, this isn't a negative comment, it's just his experience, and it was certainly had an impact on me, but that was one person, a, a rock star's experience. Not everybody can relate to that. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but it was certainly eye-opening and what he had gone through was certainly inspiring to a lot of people. But I thought we have in the book, a um, 19 year old who passed away. We have a, an, an 18 year old who starts to get hooked on pills. We have a, a, a young teen who is introduced to drugs by his father and every drug he's done, he's done with his father. And in fact, during his anxiety-ridden teenage years, his father used to give him heroin to calm him down, thinking he was doing him a favor. Um, you've got a 53-year-old grandfather who starts using heroin. You've got a pregnant mom. And so everything in between, the point that as a parent, uh, you, you certainly can see maybe your child in some of these stories. Um, or your parent. <laughs> uh, and as we were bringing these stories and my aunt, I think my, I got to say my aunt, Marilyn and my uncle George run a uh, celebrate recovery program in um, South Hadley at Life Point Church. And um, they've been doing this for years. And when I said I was doing this, I would like their advice. And they said, you want any volunteers? I said, well, if you know someone, well, <laughs> we, careful uh, what you wish for. Exactly. Uh, so many of several of these people that had come from Celebrate Recovery and were in the, the common um, uh, des desire, motivation with every one of these people and families was the desire to help people through their stories. Everybody just said that over and over. I hope my story can help someone. If they see something in there that prevents them from starting or gets them motivated to change, but this if this wasn't said over and over, which then motivated me 
oh, now I got to get their story. Now I have to do this. <laughs> but that that diversity and and really the the help and the willingness of people to say, you know, and this I can't say enough, the willingness of people to say, here's my story, as difficult as it is, as unflattering as this is, embarrassing and so on, they just said, you know, it's more important to get this out. It's more important for my story to have a purpose. Mm -hmm. And and you can see um, nobody really held back. Yeah. Which is in, which is important, obviously, but it gives it um, uh, there's such a uh, reality for those people who, whether you're 53, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a parent of a teenager, you, mm -hmm. there isn't a story you couldn't connect with on on some level for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a bravery and a courage in sharing, certainly. Yeah. Um, we're and, and it sounds like families were more than willing to to share which is incredible um you didn't shy away from death which i uh, appreciate as somebody who um feels very strongly about um treating grief um was that something that i know you um jack jonah's story is is one of them um yes. for sure so um did you ever hesitate on what you would include and wouldn't include no, well, uh, not for, from the aspect of, of death, because you can't have every story turn out well. You can't have every story because you can't ignore the harsh reality. This is what happens. If you ignore, if you don't intervene and try to do something, this can be the result. You can't ignore that. So I did not want to ignore that. But at the same time, I don't want to lose the message of hope because <laughs> that's got to be prevalent, right? Correct. Correct. So, um, so you had asked earlier about the, the pattern or order of these stories. <laughs> there was a lot to that, believe me. And it's, okay. Okay. it's an Good. interesting to hear question it. yeah, because it wasn't just throw them in where they land out because there was a, a purpose and it may not be perfect, but one, there are a few stories that turn out where people die. I didn't want to start the book off with that because that's just a tough way to start a book. And I didn't want to end it on that either, okay? Um, so in between, I knew that had to be there. And I knew the first story and the last one had to have some lift to it. But the, the few of the middle stories, again, had to go there. Um, it had to go there. So it's maybe the second, third, or fourth in the middle. Those have to be as a reminder to people um that happens the other thing is th their paths to recovery are all different and there are so many that you know you, i don't say one is best or one is what what works for that person is is the one that was best right mm -hmm. and so each of these paths to recover take different courses and it might be in and out of rehabs two times 17 times or so on um, I mentioned Celebrate Recovery is a very effective program, and a few of these people came out through Celebrate Recovery and are doing great. Um, some people take the Christian path out. It doesn't work for everyone. And it's the same thing. If I started with that, I know, I get it. People say, well, okay, that's what this is about. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but that's so important to include that it had to be there so not everyone succeeds that way but that that is a very promising path to recovery and i wanted to make sure that's included as well so again altering that was important you know and then again the other thing the 19 year old the ages and different diverse groups i think had to be mixed in as well mm -hmm. So it was like puzzle pieces. Oh, this doesn't go here. This goes here. <laughs> the balancing, I'm sure it was a balancing act. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And again, I, I appreciate um, that you included um, stories from such different um, places and, and outcomes. Um, yeah for sure was there a particular I, we do have a couple of questions i'm going to try to get to all the, the questions sure, from yeah. other people after because if i don't ask the ones i have i'm afraid i'll forget them but um is there a particular um 
I know I'm, I'm struggling with saying story, but experience is a chapter um, that um, affected you differently than you than you had thought or, 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 or not necessarily anyone that maybe you included, but was there something that, that kind of struck you differently than, than you thought? I hate to dodge the question and say all of them, but, <laughs> but there's, a, there's a point to saying that because all of them in a different way. Okay. Uh, in a different way, because I think, and believe me, um, and I, I can't tell you uh, uh, the, the discussions, the, I don't want to say interviews, but the meetings with everyone. Sometimes they're over the phone. Sometimes I got voice recordings I had to decipher. Sometimes it was an emotional talk across their kitchen table. And then each one of these stories got to me. I cried writing this. <laughs> And I had to stop. I mean, I don't mean stop, come back in an hour, stop in March and come back in June kind of a thing. <laughs> I mean, it was just, a, it was overwhelming. And each one did get to me. Um, and I got to know most of the people at different levels, but I, I was, at, I, I, my wife just got home. <laughs> so uh, the, but, but if you say one in particular that I might have related to more um, was the last story of Jeff. He's a 53 year old. He had um, four daughters and several grandchildren and he starts using heroin. Well, I have um, sons and four grandchildren. And I thought, oh, my goodness, how? And he was more closer to my age. And I said, how, how would this happen? What would I do if I was? So I related to his, his age and his upbringing when he told me the roots of his problem. Now, he um, drank beer and had a good time in high school and college, and so did I, you know, and went through some of that stuff. And uh, he had back injuries and took pain pills. And for me, and I'm lucky I escaped it, but I've had 12 knee surgeries. And every single one, I get a little bottle of, you know, Oxy to take home with me. And that was ripe. That's like, you know, um, step right up because you, you, I, I fortunately didn't get addicted to, to that, but I could see how that could happen. Um, and, and I remember one summer, summer of 99, I had extensive knee surgery and I was living alone at the time and I had my bottle and I was home with nothing to do and I slept all day and I was awake all night, needed more pills and a few months of depressed fuzziness i snapped out of it four months later whatever but i thought what the hell just happened mm -hmm. um so i recall that anyway with that last story i could relate to him because of different things sure. and each of them maybe as a dad i could relate to some of the stories and it hit me that way or a brother or a friend because a few of these people i've known a good part of my life and I've been friends with them and I knew certain people here that for a long time. So I, it just got to me in a way I did not expect at all. Okay. So, um, that was hard, mm -hmm. very hard. Yeah. So <laughs> there's, there's a heaviness to, yes. um, what living and loving somebody with substance use disorder or living with somebody is like, or losing somebody. To substance use disorder. I mean, that certainly. Um, so the sprinkling in hope in in some of your chapters and stories of hope is is so incredibly needed um, because right we can't every story can't end um, it's so painfully. Um, many do, um, but so um, when you started the thinking of writing this book was there one goal at the end of it or was it again you I know you started with a, it was going to be a booklet when it became a book what what were you hoping um an outcome or the outcome would be of, the, of putting this book out well um I think the outcome was became based on the people who volunteered to be part of the book and what they repeated to me so often i want my story to help someone i hope somehow my story can influence somebody mm 
And I, I, that became my driving motivation, right? To say, well, I've got these eight families that are, like you said, courageously sharing their stories. And for what purpose? If I can help fulfill that purpose, if I can get it out there so that somebody it would mean more to me than anything, if, if somebody came up and said, you know, I was on the verge of this, or I gave up on my son or daughter, and I didn't because something inspired me through so-and-so story, that, that would do it. I may never know that. <laughs> and I know... Yes. <laughs> you said that earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it has. And I think I think you know whether it was it was your um uh first intention or, or greatest intention to it, your work has affected um families and people um in a way that is very um raw and real. So we you know to talk about um the experiences of somebody using a child, using um, losing a family member. I mean, these are things that I think people do at times shy away from, and then therefore become part of that cycle of shame and guilt and embarrassment. And if we don't talk about it, then it doesn't exist. That so the idea that it's important to share people's stories, but you're certainly these stories and chapters have affected um, many many people. Uh, just got a, a comment from one of our own um, group family members, um, Patty, who says it certainly has affected me. Um, you know, and I, I think um, it's interesting because I, I, I wonder for everybody who reads it, you know, which story or chapter they relate to, why, um, then the, the, the question, not the questioning of would they do it differently or could they have done it, but seeing how one family, um, you know, treated um, their loved one. So it's just, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, you've affected people, trust me. <laughs> well, I, you know, there's another aspect that I'll just mention because I'll forget to, and you might've noticed that now when, when I read the heroin diaries by Nikki six, you, you mentioned raw and real, mm -hmm. well, that's really raw and really, really, um, mm -hmm. vulgarity. Unfiltered. Unfiltered. Uh, oh, oh, it's totally unfiltered. Yes. And so, um, I have, as I mentioned, I have teenage, I have four grandchildren, two of them are teenage daughters, uh, granddaughters. And so I thought, this can't be at that level. Uh, to, to, so that parents will say, oh, my daughter is not reading that, because it certainly <laughs> could have gone deeper with the vulgarities and the graphic, all that stuff. But um, I, one of the goals was to make this uh, comfortable for parents to recommend to their teenage children. Okay. And that was a fine line because you just talked about the rawness and, and the heavy aspect mm -hmm. of this, but there's no swearing. There's, it's pretty clean in terms of that aspect. Sure. And I have, I, I asked my son and daughter-in-law, would you have, you know, your Lily and Bryn read this and Lily and Bryn, I said, no, it's fine. I said, okay, good. Because what good would it do if you couldn't recommend to high school aged kids, it would defeat part of the point, wouldn't it? Yes. Yep. So that's why it was written the way it was, so that it'd be comfortably read by teenage children and be recommended by parents or teachers for that age group. Yeah, no, I like that. I think the um I like that the that it is readable um for for all ages, certainly. Um the feelings are always going to be raw. As you yeah. described your own experience with writing is that sometimes when we're not even aware of it, um, we'll read something and it just, it brings about um, that, that emotion. Um, so we're getting a couple of comments. So um, Dennis says, I love every story. It makes me know that I'm not, which is the, um, it's the goal. That's the goal. Um, and our common dear friend, Lori, um, also sends a heart and says that you certainly have affected her as well. I, um, when I first um, read this book, actually it was sent to me by, um, by Lori. Um, and um, she, she reminded me that um, early on when starting our family support groups, one of the things that I said to our group members is we should write a book. 
and um, you did, which was great. So it gets me off the hook. Um, but but that that's that was the idea is that everybody has a chapter. You know, everybody has their experience. And although um, loving somebody with substance use disorder or losing somebody to substance use disorder will have common um, themes and feelings and experiences and patterns, each story is going to be slightly different, certainly being told by the person um, living it. So um, there actually are some members in my family groups who have written their chapter um, or have at least started it, I remember, okay. um, yeah. which was, um, uh, you know, it was going to be used as, as a I don't want to say a lesson, but, um, you know, an, an example, an assignment to um, the same way the journaling is used to just get those thoughts, those feelings out of your head, yeah. make room, yeah. make room for other things. So yeah. um, to not ignore it, but to, to have it in, a, in another way. So um, you will never um, be short of, of people who have stories to tell, for sure. Um, yes. Unfortunately, um, I would I would like it if if both you and I could find different careers and not have to not have to to you know do this work in a way that as it continues to grow and grow. But um, so let me just take a couple of questions. So we have a question from. Um, Melissa, um, and she says, Mike, in talking to any of those um, who have used and are survived in recovery, um, did you ever by chance ask them what um, what they might have felt would have prevented them from continuing to from using, or would there have been something that would have kind of intervened or prevented them from starting to use? You know, that's that's a tough one. I think we've discussed that with different people, but it becomes such a hypothetical if. Sure. someone had but if not only if someone said something but if if they were perhaps more convincing because obviously what they might have said didn't work um but if i was listening to one of chris heron's um i think it was a ted talk but i think that and i've heard him say this before i wish somebody told me this i wish somebody told me that my twenty dollar a day habit would turn into you know twenty thousand a month. I wish somebody told me, and and he goes on, and certainly that's what I hear from this. The, I wish somebody told me, but it probably did. You just don't remember. And um, even then, would you have listened? Who, and then it makes you think: If I tell somebody, are they going to listen? What's going to make them listen? What's going to be different about what I say to make them listen? Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. If we all knew, uh, that'd be different, but I don't know, but we keep trying. And maybe that's part of this. Maybe if somebody hears a story and they say, oh my God, that's me, that's mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And I can't stand to do this another day because I see what could happen. So I need to make a change. So maybe it's, it's, it's the repeatedly repeated, um, message that has to come through mm. but yeah i think everyone has mentioned that gosh if i had only listened to someone but you can't uh, change I, I think it requires that perfect storm of um the messages are certainly out there all the time and we know yeah. that tre treatment is available and and recovery is possible and um we know that all exists it's the perfect storm of that message being sent and the ability to hear it and then hold on. I mean, how often we say, I'm going to hold on, you know, just just hold my hand, or ju just hang on, and we'll do this. But it's it takes both, you know, both um, participating. Yeah. So And it's timing. Sometimes someone's ready to hear it. Sometimes they're not, right? And that's right. right. We so you don't give up on saying it. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> Correct. I, I frequently in, in my family support groups share that I want um, the family members themselves to be the best versions of themselves, the strongest, most capable versions of themselves, so that when that question is posed to them, what can you know, they have, they're ready, whatever comes at them, they're ready, because I think that there is a sense of um, helplessness that comes to family members, and so being able to know, okay, I'm good, I've got my network of people, I know who I would call, I, 
I'm taking care of myself. I'm, I'm, you know, getting myself to be the best version of me and my loved one needs me. You know, I've got it. So I frequently, I frequently tell people that's what we're aiming for. Um, yeah. Let's see another story. Um, how many families did you interview? I think you answered that one in your research. Um, did they fall into any patterns or could there, oh, or could there be another book with more stories? <laughs> Well, that's a great question because there were several, besides the eight that are in this book, there were two or three others that I was working with, but just for one reason or another didn't materialize. I know one person was going through active addiction during it and um, she was here, she ended up in Ohio. I, I couldn't keep track and I just couldn't do it. I, I wanted to. Um, and then other people stopped and started and um, and unfortunately, there was one other person um, that that um, started it, but had to go under treatment for cancer and, um, and they passed away in June. And so it was just very sad ending to that. But um, he was very willing to share his story. So it started off with 10 or 11, but the eight people who believe me and I have a massive respect for everybody who said we'll keep going we'll keep going we'll, we'll get this out there um and after this was out and again speaking with people there we're we're going to do another book um but this might be slightly different only because all these are from western mass right the the, the ones in this book and now I've got someone from Arizona uh, North Carolina, Virginia, California, who, who say, no, I have a story and I'd be willing to put it out there and help me. Okay. And I'm hearing from a few others. So I said, okay, well, we've got, this will be just an expanded version <laughs> over from different parts of the country, but that led to something else. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take a oh, quick it. minute to, to tell you what, what again, the sort of be careful what you wish for, because it starts to evolve unexpectedly. Um, this whole thing about what I've learned over the past year and a half or two is, like you said, a lot of people want their stories told. And maybe sometimes they don't know how or where to start. Um, other than just telling a story in a group, in a room, okay, but how do I get it there to have and to, to get it written and for it to be out there for people to learn from? Again, because using that common desire, like I want my story to help somebody, well, it can't until it's told. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that for people besides, you know, hey, you want to be in a book? Uh, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe that doesn't work. But so we decided to put it, we're going to, we're working on this now. It's not official, but we're working on um, um, a place for people to go to share their stories. And I think we're going to call it Healing Voices Project. That's what we're leaning towards and what 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 would the purpose be what would it look like well it's so it's a website where we're going to have you know people hey share your stories you know um connect with people inspire someone to make a change save a life all these powerful things can be done through your story so if you've had your story and you don't know where to begin how to start to do, we'll help with that you, it's going to be a place where you can email me and we'll talk through it. We'll write it up. You can write it up. They could, we'll make sure it's what they want. Right. And we put it on the website and we might have, we might end up with 10 or 20 or 30 or who knows how many stories we get, but from different parts of the country, we'll have a place where you can go, you know, and find some, I, I don't know how we'll lay it out, but it'll be there for a place um, and a platform for people to, to, actually tell their stories and it's therapeutic for the person telling it like you said get it off their head um but from there um from that we might say okay we're going to take eight or ten of those stories and create a book from that some people's stories are really long and some are short some might be a page some might be endless um <laughs> I, I, this just might be provide, like I said earlier, when we, I was listening to Chris speak, everyone doesn't have the capacity or the desire or the, or they might have the desire, but they just don't have, know where to begin and, or have a platform where to tell their story. So we're working on that. 
and I, I think this this hopefully does some good and provides uh, a place for people to to do that. Yeah, you got You've got some some fans for sure. Um, Dennis, uh, this book has allowed me to help others who suffer from this disease every day. Thank you, Mike. Um, he loves every story. It makes him know that he's not alone. Um, one of the things I wrote down when you were just talking about people sharing, but first of all, that idea, like I, I get chills. That's the most amazing idea ever. And I think if you think you're just going to get 10 or 20, you might want to rethink that because there, <laughs> there are yeah. hundreds of people who have, have stories to tell. And, um, what I've noticed, um, a gift blessing of being able to do uh, family work with our families at the Heron Project, but also the grief work as well, is that they're very, they're on different trajectories for sure. And so those families still um, where whose loved ones are either actively using or actively in recovery, I, I often say it's very simplified, but they're on the roller coaster they didn't buy the ticket for. Yeah, that's you're right. Yep. Okay, so they're doing the ups and downs and at any moment, we, certainly in our, our groups that we could have a great week and then the next week somebody has either relapsed um, or, or unknown where they are. Similarly, somebody could have come onto group and say their their loved ones in treatment. I mean, it, it's a it's it's the roller coaster, um, but it brings you to places you never may, may not have ever known existed. Um, it's certainly places you didn't think you were ever going to be or want to experience. So being able to hear other people who are on that same roller coaster is healing in and of itself. Yeah. That's the, that's the thing is that we can't change it today. We can't control it today, but we can know that we're not alone in it. And there are other people on this roller coaster and um, they're getting just as nauseous and, and sick and excited in, in all those same places. So yeah. on one hand, I mean, I, I, I love, that for sure. Those families need to know they're not alone on that roller coaster. Our families experiencing grief, it's a different, a different trajectory. They've had the worst day of their life already. They have a, a, a starting point that is much different than the roller coaster. And so to know that there are other people who share the things that um, aren't really acceptable to say out loud or to talk about um, in the world and feel uncomfortable even sharing about death, um, to know that there are other people in other parts of this country, other parts of this world who have the same experience. I mean, that's why group work is perfect for all of these populations. This is, this is what works is having other humans, human connection, healing yes. each other. I mean, this is, this is why I, I love this work so much because it's, it's members together or readers and authors doing this work together that creates the healing. It's not, time doesn't heal, what we do with time heals. So if we're together and sharing, um, that's healing. So yeah. you said something that reminded me of, and when you said, you know, you, it takes you places you never expected to be. And it brings you to say and do things you'd never expected to do or say. And a friend of mine, um, while I was writing this, um, his son is, is not in the book. His son um, was, a, was a heroin act, addict for many, many years. And he said, Mike, you know, there were times when I said, maybe he's better off dead. Maybe we're all better off if he's dead. Now, that's hard to reconcile that, right? It's hard to think how can anybody think that? And unless you've gone through it, you can't relate to that. But hearing him say that blew me over because I thought you can't, that's a place where you never expected to be. 100. Yeah. And, and when you hear that and you go, wow, um, you can't now the good news is his son came out of it and his son's doing fine and everything's much much better but you know but it brings you to say I, in other words i'm at the end of my rope i don't know what to do and i can't i i, I can't go another day mm -hmm. so that that's something one example of, of being somewhere you'd never ever expect to be yeah 
And I think that if somebody in one of our, our um, members here just said, um, uh, sadly, I identify with that. Um, that's why these stories uh, in the book offer hope. Um, it's yeah. if, um, if people say those things out loud, mm -hmm. it comes with a judgment. It does. I mean, who, people uh, would never imagine a parent saying they wish their child. But when you spend years watching a child or a loved one or a friend struggle with a chronic progressive illness, you're right. This isn't, this isn't, we don't say or do things that we would have expected ourselves to and we don't feel the things that we expected. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And and you you can relate if you've been there. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and I uh, I encourage families uh, to when they get to that place, um, I will say let's have a real discussion. Like, yeah. Where are we? Where are we headed? And what do we right. want to prepare ourselves for? And what do we want to help prepare our loved ones for? So. Um, yeah. So Scott says, hi, everyone. Hope for Holyoke Rocks and recovery is real. You've got quite a, a quite a fan base out there in Western Mass, that's, uh, Central Mass. That's awesome. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, and I'll mention this, and he'll probably kill me, uh, but one there's one special guest on here. Did you notice Dennis? Yes. Dennis is chapter two, and he's here. Dennis! <laughs> <laughs> All right, hang on. Hi, Dennis. <laughs> hi, Dennis. Uh, That's wonderful. So it, Dennis, Dennis, let me, or yeah. I hope Dennis, you can, you can hear me say this. I applaud your bravery and your courage and your honesty. Um, I, I, we all don't get better without each other or we don't, you know, heal. So I am eternally grateful, Dennis. So thank you. I'm glad. Oh, I'm glad he's here. I didn't yeah, know that was Debbie. Dennis. Debbie and, and, De De yes. and Debbie. Yeah, both. Um, Dennis, well, that all makes sense. I didn't make the connection now. Yeah. yeah. And um, <laughs> the thing is, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> um, something Dennis said that stuck with me. Oh, there's a lot of things Dennis says that sticks with me. There's a lot I try to forget, too. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. As um, with all good friends. I, I, I could, no. Yeah. I, um, Dennis said something. Uh, he works at the Holyoke ER. And he does counseling for people who, who come in and have gone through the struggle. And a few years ago, um, a doctor uh, approached him and uh, she, she was a bit of a mess. And this is a doctor. And Dennis started talking to her and she says, I just don't know what to do. My family's a mess. My husband is a drug addict. Um, and no matter what I do, it doesn't work. I, I just don't know what to do. I don't know. I've run out of options and I'm exasperated. I'm, and she's crying and, um, it hit him. This is a doctor. This is a doctor who went to school for treating people, knows how to prescribe things, knows everything, but she doesn't know how to handle her husband who's going through addiction. If that doctor doesn't know. How are we as husbands, wives, brothers, fathers supposed to know? <laughs> and, and that to me was an amazing insight um, how a lot of us just are, are, are helpless. Mm -hmm. is, is educated and as trained as you might be. Right. Absolutely, right? Nobody's yeah. immune. No, it's right. this, the substance use disorder does not discriminate. It does not care where you grew up how you grew up how much money you have how many cars you own um it's there's no right nobody is immune i right. firmly believe that um well dennis and debbie i'm glad you guys are with us i wish i had knew earlier that you were the debbie dennis i should have said something earlier that's but no that's okay <laughs> that's okay again i i, I appreciate it. so um so for anybody who hasn't, um, see, Mike, you and I could go on and on and on and on. See? I have a, yeah, we could. <laughs> <laughs> 50 something minutes already. So for anybody who hasn't read uh, Mike Torville's book, so it's Voices from the Fallen, True Stories of Addiction, Grief, Recovery, and Courage. Um, chapter nine, eight chapters of stories and some um, reflections as well. And I'm just, I'm incredibly grateful. Um, where can people, so Amazon? People yeah, can get Amazon. Amazon. Okay. Yeah. 
I was lucky enough to have it just sent to me from Lori. So Lori, <laughs> I know you're there. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, my dear. For thank you, Lori. Yeah. Yes, connecting, connecting us. Yeah. Um, and and you know, what's so what's next for you, Mike? So you you talked about the the project. Website. Yeah, well, and we'll we'd love we'll be talking ongoing. Um, of course, of course. And uh, so I'll keep you updated on that. And as once that launches, I'd love to get with you guys again and sure. say, okay, here's how, here's how it works. And, and maybe people will like to participate. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, again, you are never going to, to be at a loss for stories, you know, for certain way that, uh, Aaron project runs 20, um, family support groups every wow. week. Wow. And each one is attended some, you know, five or six others have 13 or 14 weekly attendance. Every person has um, a story and those, those registrations come in every day. So mm -hmm. um, we are grateful enough to, to have people ask for help and be able to provide help. So, um, sure. you know, you never be at a loss. <laughs> no, I don't care what you wish for, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm grateful um, for your for your talent in writing because this was well, thank, this, thank this you was very much amazing, yeah. um, and thank you for your time. Um, sure. I've I've loved this. Um, any last parting words for anybody out there? Any inspiration you want to throw to us? I'll just mention one thing quick it, sure. with people here. I'd love to hear from anybody. So if you want to share my email, that's fine. Yes, 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 yes. Um, let's see if I can coordinate it and put it in. The, well, you know what? If you can just, um, can you just say it? And then if for, oh, I'll it'll just be, say it. It'll be sure. recorded. So people who watch it again will be able to. Yeah. To watch yeah. It, 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 okay. Tell me when to say it. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, it's MK Torville. Uh, that's T O U R V I L L E, M K Torville at gmail.com. So, we'd love to hear from anybody. You're going to need to increase or... your storage. Oh, Patty, thank you. Patty, our my our Patty. Oh, um, okay. Project Zone Patty, put, uh, put that in the chat for me. She's fantastic. Um, I get so I don't know how much storage your Gmail has, but uh -oh. you might need to up it. <laughs> <you> just... <laughs> Pandora's box. But the, the, the stories that, um, that I hope you're able to hear from those that whose story I already know um, are um, are incredible as everybody's stories are, and um, the gift of allowing people to share their stories is is amazing, um, and so it heals us all. Yeah, and being able to share it, um, you being being heard.